Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Thanks for being with us. Our guest this week is James McEachin. He's a well-known actor. He's also a veteran of the U.S. Army and the Korean War. For his service, he received the Silver Star and a Purple Heart. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. It's an honor. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you're most welcome. Let's start your story at the very beginning. Where were you born and raised? Well, I'm still waiting to be born. No, I'm a little kidding you. <laughs> um, I was born in Rennert, North Carolina, and I stayed there in Rennert until I was about four years old, and then uh, my mother sent for me. Well, no, she didn't really send for me. I would swallowed uh, uh, some lye. I used to keep lye around the pumps and all that for washing clothes and whatever. And uh, and I, in my curious nature, went up and drank a mouthful of it and I had my esophagus burnt out and I, they uh, transferred me to um, Hackensack, New Jersey, where my mother was. And uh, I, my, my, would you believe it? I survived. And here I am. When did you join the service? August the 8th, 1947. Why did you join then? I wanted to be a part of this vast thing called the United States military. I wanted to be a soldier. You weren't even 18 years old at this point yet, right? No, I was... Actually, when I, my interest was first aroused during, uh, when I was around 14 or 15 or something like that. But, uh, you know, it was d- during the era of... Uh, after December 7, 1941, of course. Uh, the country was on sort of like a, a, a war footing. You know, you used to have to go out to... Uh, uh, get tin cans, <laughs> silk stockings, and um, all items made of rubber and uh, and metal, and save it for the war effort. And I kind of enjoy that. And then, but the height of it all was to uh, be in uniform that you can contribute to. You, I don't know if it was mine was out of a sense of patriotism, or just some old uh, idea of it being somewhat magical of being a part of something much larger than yourself. Why did you choose the Army? Uh, because they had a sign outside and, and, and the other guys didn't. Uh, it never occurred to me that the Navy was, uh, uh, not that the Navy wasn't a part of this great machinery, uh, but the Army had the recruiting posters out, uh, Uncle Sam want you. And then I just identified that as uh, being uh, Army as opposed to uh, the Navy saying, Uncle Sam wants you, you know. Where did you go for training? Fort Dix, New Jersey. What was that like? It was interesting. I, the first thing I noticed was how uh, low-key and how uh, sparsely populated the, the base was, you know. It was just, you know, the first time ever being ever being away from home. And uh, you saw these lines of barracks, and then you saw these these guys walking in on uniform and responding to commands and all of that. It was really fascinating to, to me. Was it something you liked? Yeah, yeah, it was something different. You know, I had never seen, uh, other than, uh, I've never seen formation, but when my, and my brother-in-law used to come home from, uh, on furlough and pass, and then he was stationed. What was he stationed in Oklahoma or someplace like that? And uh, he used to. I used to ask him about questions, and I would wear his, put on his combat boots, and uh, you feel that, that, that this invincible aura around you because you were wearing a uniform, and uh, you, you know that you had insignias and patches and all of that. It was just. It was great. Loved it. Now that's right about the time President Truman integrated the armed forces, right? Well, actually, the integration had been going on a long time. It just wasn't, uh, they didn't, it wasn't promulgated or it wasn't really known that much. The, when it became effective, uh, at least in the camp at Fort Dix, was, uh, it was in 1950. That was when I re-enlisted in the Army. That's when it started taking um, hold. Of course, uh, gosh, I used to, there was a time when I could quote uh, the language from that uh, miscegenation or that uh, desegregation order. I can't do it anymore. Memory has it's, 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 it's slipped considerably. How did things change for you as a result of that? It, it wasn't as uh, monumental as it might have seemed uh, for the time. It, just, it was just something to do. You, The CO came out and uh, addressed us and said that uh, we were going to break up the 
the unit. Some of you guys will be moving into the uh, uh, to Company C or whatever the companies was, and uh, and and that's that. We really didn't want to, or at least I wasn't really in, in much in favor of mixing with the whites uh, because we had such a great outfit. Uh, you know, our first sergeant was was uh, first sergeant Harry L. Miles. And he figured that because you were black, you had to outdo anything that could ever move. And uh, so I, we really didn't want to, to lose him. And he was transferred, you know, as all of us guys were transferred to to to, uh, to integrate. And uh, but it was not really that not really that big of a deal. There were no flags waving, no Fourth of July sort of hoopla or whatever. So there wasn't any friction. Every now and then you'd catch your, you know, the N word tossed around or something like that. And uh, but it was no friction to any large scale uh, where somebody had gone outright go and shoot somebody because of the fact you were moving in or in that case, moving out or whatever. You just mentioned how demanding your sergeant was. So let's back up a little bit and go a little bit deeper into what training was like for you. Training was uh, I well, that that jumps back to the to the segregation days. Uh, it was it was hard. It was uh, they really wanted to uh, to make a man out of you, and uh, obviously ours was uh, uh, was somewhat different because we were segregated at the time. But it was just it was hard, and they wanted you to be a good soldier. You know, and they instilled in this thing that, not, that while you were not invincible, you were something to deal with. And uh, and whenever you would go for machine gun training where, you know, they shoot the bullets over your head, you just hope to <laughs> not to raise your head up and you would be uh, nicely touched up. But uh, it was, uh, it was, it was and then, listen, I was 17. What did I know about life? And uh, so it was just, uh, it was something to do. Do you remember when in 1950 you decided to re-enlist in the army? Uh yeah, when I got yes, yeah, so when I got a see, I enlisted in 1947, right, and for three years, and then we came back uh, from Japan. I've uh, not stayed in Japan all that time, and then we came back to uh, uh, to the states. The army froze all discharges on the the fifth uh, of July. I think it was the fifth of Ju- July. That's when they froze all discharge. Well, I had gotten discharged on the 4th or the 3rd or something like that. I had missed it one day. Otherwise, I would have stayed in the Army, right? I wouldn't have to go through this thing of enlisting. But I wanted to enlist because I wanted to be a part of this vast thing called the United States Army. And particularly, we took all of that training, did all of this stuff for nothing, and now I'm, I'm a civilian? No way. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to be in the military, and so I re-enlisted and was eventually shipped to... Uh, uh, to Korea, but before that, they want I went to the engineers, and that didn't work. I, I didn't train to be an engineer. I'm a soldier, you know. And, and uh, the true soldier was the guy that was in the infantry. You know, so one thing led to another, and I ended up going to the infantry. And I'll be damned when I when I got to Korea that they didn't want me to change my MOS to be a to be a clerk. No, <laughs> I'm a soldier, you know. So that was. Uh, uh, and so eventually I went with K Company in, uh, on the 39th, and, uh, and there I stayed until we went uh, to Kojido, which is something in American history people don't really realize. That's where the enemy had captured a, a brigadier general, General F.T. Dodds, and uh, we were going to free him, and a lot of things happened, but nothing happened, and we eventually went left Kojido and uh, we uh, went back on the line like everybody else. On the lines meaning the front lines. There's a couple minutes remaining before our first break here, Mr. McEachin, and there's so much more to that story that we'll get to shortly. But in speaking with Korean War veterans before North Korea invaded the South, most American soldiers said they knew virtually nothing about Korea. Did you know where it was? No, heck, never, never, never heard of it. Yeah, just uh, maybe someplace on the other side of the moon or something. We never knew. Uh, uh, Korea, what is that? What were your duties inside the 2nd Infantry Division? Uh, just a regular infantry soldier. To, uh, you know, when uh, 
I was sitting around waiting for something to happen or, you know, going, going out on patrols and to, uh, uh, to see if we could capture some of the enemy and get the uh, intel from them. James, we need to take a break. I'm speaking with U.S. Army and Korean War veteran James McEachin. He's the recipient of the Silver Star and the Purple Heart. And we'll get into all of that when we come back on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm honored to be joined today by James McEachin. He's a veteran of the Korean War who has also enjoyed a successful career in the entertainment industry. And we'll learn a little bit more about that later on. Uh, Sir, we've talked about your general assignments inside the 2nd Infantry Division, but it's a miracle that you're still here to tell this story. Oh, it is. I, and, and I don't want to shortchange God or those very fortunate things that, that has occurred to, uh, to, to, to overlook those things there because uh, they were, I, I was just one of the anointed ones who uh, uh, it's just you had this cloak of invincibility. And, and you get that. I think that comes from the first time you're fired upon and you're not hit, you know. Hey, I'm I'm cool. I can do this. What was your first combat experience like? That was on uh, uh, one night on a patrol, and uh, and we saw this guy walking along the ridge line, and I fired at him, and the guy went down. It was a strange, strange sensation, knowing that uh, you uh, that you shot a person, you you took a human life. Of course, you can turn around and say, well, but he was the enemy. Well, <laughs> the shoe can be placed on the other foot, you know. But you, you tell yourself you can't bathe in those waters, that uh, uh, he is the enemy, and your country deemed that he was the, entry, the, the enemy, and so therefore you must do as you, you must follow the dictates of your, uh, of your nation. Now, you had the upper hand that day. On a different day, you were the victim of an ambush. Tell us what happened that day. We, we were assigned to go on a patrol uh, to rescue uh, one of our guys whom the enemy had captured and pinned them upside down on the side of this hill. And so we were under the command of Lieutenant Schenck. He got this patrol together, and we, that night we went to, uh, to free this body, and we walked in a, into an ambush. And we were uh, uh, just uh, annihilated. And to this day, to that day, we're not exactly sure about what happened because there were only two survivors. Uh, it was me and this blonde head boy. And uh, that night, uh, uh, the night of the attack, uh, this, I got wounded in both legs, uh, on the thigh and a leg here, and then a wound here that I still have or rather the bullet fragment I still have here in the, uh, located between the ribs. But the story is that this guy who did everything humanly possible to save me, he did. And the fact that I was moaning and screaming because whenever you, you, he couldn't carry me like with the hands over the shoulders because this would dig in deeper and it was, uh, uh, and he couldn't cradle me because of the fact that I had there was shrapnel here and it was digging deep into the uh, to the thigh muscle, and the same thing with this one. So he had one hell of a time, but yet and still he struggled on. And never once did I think, or never once did I believe uh, he would leave me. And as he said in one of the conversation, if the shoe were on the other foot, would you leave me? <laughs> And I think I would have left him. I'd like to be heroic and noble and say, well, no, uh, no way. We leave no man behind. But I'm not so certain that I would have had his courage uh, to struggle uh, the way he did. I mean, we were out there till uh, till noon the next day day or three or four o'clock. I have no idea of knowing of how, what all this guy uh, went through. And I do remember he went, he set me down, or laid me down, to get, uh, to go and get some water to refill in, in the canteen, uh, to refill his canteen. And I thought that he was going to just take off and uh, just going to run. 
and I had uh, I had one grenade left with me that I was going to throw at him. It wouldn't make any sense anyway, because I couldn't throw that far. But in my mind, and then I also had a forty-five. In my mind, I was I was going to kill him, and I don't feel happy about it even to this day. Obviously, he came back. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He did come back. Uh, and he got me to the line, and I said to him, I told him that, and, it's, and the guy said, his attitude was, I know you were. And he said it so calmly that I thought it was a Jesus figure. And from that day to this day, I still think the same thing. In fact, I'm more convinced of it now then. How badly were you injured? Well, the spleen. I never heard, I never knew we had a thing called a spleen until... Uh, I looked at the telegram that uh, they had, the War Department had sent my mother, and uh, it said the wound consists of a thigh wound and a spleen and the liver. Did they end up needing to remove your spleen? I don't know if they did or not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know if it would. If they were planning on doing it, uh, that's a good question. Of sixty, sixty years, I'm, I haven't even thought of it. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't really know. Let's take a quick break. Much more with James McEachin in just a moment, right here on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus, honored to be joined today by James McEachin, a successful Hollywood actor and also a veteran of the Korean War and the United States Army. For his service, he received a Purple Heart and the Silver Star. And James, you were just telling the story of being ambushed and nearly left for dead and may have been, if not for the determination of the only other survivor. Yeah. Well, I, I did, now that I'm recounting the story, what happened was that I knew that this guy had, I was in the front of the, I was a point man on the, on the patrol, and he's, this guy was bringing up the rear. Uh, and the lieutenant, after my lieutenant just started firing and firing after we encountered the, the enemy, of course, started firing and firing. This was the Lieutenant Shank. He was the bravest man I'd ever seen in my entire life. And so I woke up. I know there was an explosion. I woke up in, in this creek. And then the first thing that happens when, uh, when you have a stomach wound is to get thirsty. And so that's what I did. I started drinking this filthy, slimy, uh, phosphorus-laden water. And uh, the guy, this blonde-headed guy, approached me from out of the darkness and said, he challenged me, who goes there? And I said, I'm an American soldier. Uh, who, who are you? And one thing led to another. He exposed himself, and he came to look at me. He said, well, oh, my God, you, you know, you, you're wounded. I said, well, don't just do something, you know what I mean? And so he tried to lift me because he didn't know if the Chinese were coming back or not. And so he carried me away to safety, meaning the, the, the tourniquet out of his pant leg out of his fatigues, and then um, we got a few feet away from, uh, a few yards away from uh, the creek, and uh, then he started nursing, you know, trying to cover up the, the uh, to stop the bleeding on the, the left leg, which I thought they, they were going to have to amputate this leg. Well, what it was, it was just a, a long piece of shrapnel about that long. I saw it that, that they, uh, uh, when I got to the hospital, and then we went to, uh, the other leg was had something like little pitted marks here, but the one in the stomach that's where I kept getting the stomach ache from uh from the wound, and the scar runs from here to right about there and um but this guy was determined he was going to to save my life it was uh, and I was a little a little testy to say the least. And, uh, you know, and, um, the guy had some uh, a candy bar with him, and he shared that with me. But there again, he didn't want me to eat it because of the fact that, uh, uh, you know, you don't, you're not supposed to have, eat anything when you have a stomach wound. And uh, he just did everything he could possibly do that, to see that I survived. So we would go and move along another few hundred yards, and then he would set me down and look and nurse the wound, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it was just awful. Uh, but he hung in there, and you know, when even when uh, you see, he couldn't carry me over his shoulders like that, you know, uh, because of this wound here, and it really, it, it, it was just uh, painting. Uh, after it found a way to paint, I think when the first few times it was just bad only because of the fact that the, the tissues uh, just get almost uh, 
you can't feel the pain. And then eventually, it's like the dentist, it's like, and then eventually the, the pain comes. And so he kept repeating of the, the, the action about changing the bandage for the, for, uh, all during the time out there. And eventually we got back to our line. And on the hill, there was one of our soldiers standing guard, and the guy held it down. Uh, we were Americans, help us. And they sent a litter down. Uh, and uh, as, the, as the American medics were taking over, that's when, he, and he started to leave, he said, well, what, something like, I, you're here now. And, and as he was going away, I said, hey, I never got your name. And he very calmly, cool, this is the blonde-haired boy, says, I never got yours either. Maybe it's better to, 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 uh, to be that way because names have a way of changing people. And then I remember saying to myself, my, you dumb son of a bitch here. You were ready to shoot the son of Jesus. That is truly an amazing story. How long did it take for you to recover? That, after I uh, went to the forward aid station, I, I was, I don't know, a couple, a couple of weeks. I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I really don't know how long I stayed in the hospital. I went from the hospital forward aid station uh, from where, the, where, the, uh, where our company was positioned to, uh, to the hospital in Japan. What happened is I eventually left the hospital uh, to come back to my unit. Now, how I found my way back to my unit uh, in, in Korea, I don't know. To this day, I don't know. But you came back to your unit? Yeah, stayed there for a couple of days. No, I stayed there one day. And then I got so frightened, so scared, my mind had become just all, totally disoriented. I, I saw trees moving and everything. Well, I was going through that, uh, that stress sort of thing, that battle fatigue that you call it. And I just said uh, to headquarters, I got I to gotta get out of here. I can't take this anymore. And then they cut orders for me to leave the line and to go down to the Ripple Depot and uh, come home. Then we got home, uh, got back here after the, what was it, 20-some days on ship. Uh, uh, then we landed in, uh, what was it, in uh, Seattle, I think it was Seattle, Washington, on the USS Blatchford. Uh, it was either the Blatchford or the O'Hara. I might have changed the, the ship, but it was either the Blatchford or the O'Hara. And then I stayed in uh, Seattle for a little period, and uh, they decided that uh, I could go home to Jersey. And it happened that uh, they had a snowstorm breaking, and uh, that was a year that those was the 37 GIs were killed on a, on a, in a snowstorm. And the Army ordered all aircraft grounded because of the, of, of the weather. We were going, they had sent us to, uh, to a hotel in Butte, Montana. And the reason why, uh, oh, the Brute, Montana wouldn't let us stay there because they didn't want any black soldiers staying in, in, in the hotel. And I suppose that's when I knew that I was back in the United States facing uh, segregation. We're talking with James McEachin, and for your service in the Korean War, sir, you were awarded a Silver Star and a Purple Heart. In 2005, why did it take more than 50 years for your service to get recognized? Well, I, I had always been suspicious of my having, and I hate to say this, of, of the Civil Star. I don't think I did enough to, I think my lieutenant should have been awarded, uh, I think he should have gotten the, 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 the Medal of Honor because he did everything he could do to save his platoon. He was firing like a madman. And the reason why I know this is because I was a point man, and he was just just to uh, over my left rear, and uh, he had uh, he 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 never got any any credit. And so when I got back to the states, and years and years later, I wanted to find out more about this guy called Lieutenant Henry Shank. In fact, he's the basis of my my uh, screenplay uh, until the last dog dies. Um, he deserved he deserved the the. the uh, uh, the Medal of Honor. And then there was a guy by the name of Furco who knew uh, my uh, platoon leader, and he felt that he was, knew that he, that he was, they were good friends, and he knew that this guy had done something heroic, but he never had anyone to tell him how, who, when, what, or why, and it was me. 
And so I used to call this guy when we talk about Lieutenant Shank, but, uh, and he said, well, I'm going to write, write him up to get a Medal of Honor. I read in a magazine one day, well, that Furco had died. He was a colonel, and he was going to write up the report, which had always hurt me because of the fact that Lieutenant Shank got nothing for all of his efforts and uh, his heroics. How did you finally get your Purple Heart and Silver Star? It was a congressman, and we were doing something like what you're doing here. And he he said, "Do uh, whatever happened to it, uh, to the to uh, how did you get the medal?" And I said, "I never got one, or something like that." And, but but I know I did, but I couldn't remember the circumstances or anything like that. And uh, along with it was the uh, uh, was the silver star, which I never really th- thought that I, I I didn't deserve it. Lieutenant Shank deserved it, and to some extent. Uh, the blonde head boy uh, did as well because he he saved a life. If it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be here today. But again, when I went back to uh, to my lines, uh, to, back to our company headquarters, I never found out who the boy was or anything about him. Until this day, I don't know uh, anything about him. Going through, we were doing something, and, uh, and now going through some old photographs and whatever. There is a picture of me standing in a bunker, and the guy looking over my shoulder is a blonde head boy. So I just wondered if that was the guy. But even if it is the guy, I wouldn't know his name or how to contact him. Yeah. So the whole thing was kind of steeped in in uh, an un- uh, unassailable mystery, as far as I'm concerned. We have a few minutes left in our conversation, sir. And many folks, of course, know you from your time in TV and the movies and. When you first left the service, you did police work and firefighting. You eventually moved into record producing for a short time before getting into TV and movie acting. How exactly did you make that transition? Well, I don't know. I was at, being at the right place at the right time. I had never studied or thinking about being an actor together. That's the first one you want to, to talk about. I, I, you know, I had to be walking on the street on, on uh, Melrose Avenue, and some guy walked up to me and asked me, aren't you an actor? And I said, no. And he said, you want to be an actor? I said, no, because I thought that was a guy who was uh, it's politically acceptable say at the, to say at the time. I thought the guy was a gay guy hitting on me or some stuff like that. You know, it's Hollywood, it's Melrose Avenue or whatever. And um, I said, no. Well, I didn't have a job. So he says, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm in the music business and the records and all that kind of stuff. And he said, well, do you... Uh, let's have lunch and talk about this script. And so he damn near begged me to go to this restaurant right across the street from, right a few doors down from uh, Paramount Studios. And he told me about this script, and uh, and I could see how fervently uh, he was interested in this thing here, getting it done. And uh, he invited invited me across the street to see this producer's, to go to this producer's office. And the producer took my reluctance to mean that I wasn't interested or I was beyond, uh, you know, I wanted to do something. Uh, what he has wasn't big enough for me. So uh, he finally said, why don't you take the script and read it? I don't convince you how good this thing is. So I put the script in my car and uh, drove back to uh, to this place where I was going. Oh, I had to take a Gertie Hall, who, long story, she was going to the um, unemployment office, and my, the script that this guy had given me was on the front seat of the car. She got in the car and said, oh, Jimmy, what's this book? And I said, some guy want me to be in the movies, Gert. And she said, uh, well, you going to do it? I says, no. And, and so that no one would ask me that question again. I put the script in the trunk of my car and forgot about it. And then a couple of weeks later, I get a call from this guy and says, hey, listen, we gave you that script. Uh, uh, are you going to do it? And I says, what script? I t- totally forgotten it. And uh, so finally, uh, I said, oh, that's the script that I was going to, yeah, the, the guy sent it to me and whatever. No, but the reason why I went through all that, to, to uh, the, the guy, that the, 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 the woman who found the script in, my, in the front seat of her car, her husband was, was Renee Hall. And Renee Hall was a guy that was responsible, responsible for doing all the Sam Cooke records and all that kind of stuff. And that's how I ended up in the music business, whatever. 
Did the producer on the street ever explain what he saw in you, that he wanted to put you in the movies as soon as he laid eyes on you? No, well, he wasn't a producer. His name was Art Names, okay. and he was the guy that wrote this script, and he was almost like I'm doing with my script, you know, trying to get funding or whatever to, to get a go. And uh, I never read the script, and, and I had never, it wouldn't have made any difference that I read I wouldn't know what I was re- reading. And I, to this day, I just don't, I don't, you give me a script, I, I, I'll read certain parts, I won't, I won't read the whole script. And I think I developed that bad habit from that first show. And I was the worst thing and the worst, one of the worst movies ever made. But something clicked, obviously, to make you want to do it again. Well, because I was so poor, I was just so awful, so horrendous as an actor. I didn't know you had to memorize dialogue. And the guy, just like your camera, is, is set up for the light to be reflecting off you, whatever lighting you want. Well, I didn't know they had to do all that kind of stuff because whenever I took a picture or something like that, they always say, smile, you know, uh, something like that. But never, don't be moving your arms around, uh, uh, they tell you. Well, in a movie camera, on the movie, they well, move. Don't just stand there like a stiff. And so I just used to move around a lot. Then I kept that going and for still, until I quit the acting some years later. But I got lucky because I went over to Paramount and they they, they needed someone to do like one line in a movie and this guy got got me into a senior director and boom boom boom, and then the next thing shortly after that came uh, John the the uh, True Grit thing, and uh, I got lucky enough to uh, do, which was an interesting story. Uh, we walked on the. Uh, my agent, this guy who was, he wasn't really my agent, but he, you know, he would have been King Kong's agent if he could have gotten a deal. So they took me over to this set. They said that John Wayne, in the, on the John Wayne movie, this, this director, Henry Hathaway, is looking for one guy to do this line, uh, do this one line for him. And uh, would you like to, to do it? And I said, John Wayne? Yeah, hell yeah, I'd, I'd like to do it. So we go over to the studio and we walk on the set and there is this guy sitting there talking to another guy in a director's chair. And so Alan is the agent. He pointed to uh, the guy. He said, you go and see that guy there and tell him who you are and what you want. And I said, well, Alan, how come you won't do it? And he says, no, you go and do it. You want the role, you have to do it. So I go over and I see this guy and this he's chomping on a cigar, mean, talking to this guy sitting in a chair. And what do you want? And I said, uh, my name is James McEachin, and I um, I was told to come and see you because there's a role that you have in your, in your movie that I would be good for. He said, can you act? And I said, well, I'm, I'm probably better than anybody else you got on this stage here. And this big hulking figure in, in the director's chair turned around and said, hire the son of a bitch, Henry. And that was John Wayne. <laughs> that, that, that's how I got the job. <laughs> And then Duke and I ended up being friends, which is why I did The Undefeated, because we had something in common. I had this wound that John Wayne was interested in because I was in the military, he found out. And he had just gone through an operation because of his cancer. And so we had something in common. I had this thing here, and we ended up being kind of good friends. And he said, you're going to do my next picture. And I said, yeah, sure, me doing the John, another John Wayne picture. Well, sure enough, about three weeks later, the script comes to, to the house, and it was The Undefeated, you know, and uh, 20th Century Fox. And so I called all these people and said, you just mailed me, you sent me a script over here that uh, you, you made a mistake. And they said, well, well, let's correct the mistake. So they called Bat Jack Productions, which was John Wayne's company, and they said, uh, they said, yeah, we we sent the script out to James McEachin. Yes, yeah, we sent the script out to him. And they called me and said, uh, yeah, that script is yours. You to play the role of Jimmy Collins. I said, you're kidding, <laughs> right? And then uh, Wardrobe called me to set up, the, you know, to get the setups and all that kind of stuff. And one thing led to another, and boom, that was my third picture or something like that. And Duke was great, and then I, uh, I always liked working with him. And then uh, one thing, one script led to another, and then we got lucky doing uh, 
uh, oh, Clint Eastwood uh, played Misty for me, and I had been in the music business, and uh, so that's a long, boring story, but uh, so, so I got lucky in that. What would you say is your favorite acting role? It was in a it was a television show where I was playing um, the guy that uh, approved was approved of the people going going to heaven. I know that sounds a little weird and kind of. There was a show called uh, Father Kaiser, and this chaplain, this priest, and uh, he uh, produced this show every day, and uh, he had this role for where I would play Saint Peter. And I was in charge of letting this guy come go to heaven and this guy go to the other door where he goes to hell. And uh, that was my favorite role. I'd like to see it again. We've been speaking with James McEachin, veteran of the U.S. Army, veteran of the Korean War, and also a successful Hollywood actor. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.